We're here to welcome uh, Rana Mitter. He is professor of the history and politics of modern China in Oxford and a fellow of St. Cross College. He's also a fellow of the British Academy since, since 2015. His research interests include uh, contemporary Chinese nationalism, Republican era Chinese history, and the Second Sino Japanese War. Uh, he also wrote a book about it, uh, China's War with Japan, 1937 to 1945, The Struggle for Survival, and several other books on topics like that. He appeared on TV and radio, <coughs> uh, published lots of research publications, and today he's here to give us a very short introduction on modern China. Please welcome with me Professor Rana Mitter. And it's a great pleasure to be here at Google today. Thank you all for taking your lunch break to uh, come and listen to me talking about modern China. And thank you to Jan for hosting us here uh, today. Um, I should start by saying that I think although this is going to be a talk based on a very short introduction to modern China, the book which I think you have in front of you or available at the front here, it's not going to be quite as short as the introduction to modern China that was given by a very famous historical figure, uh, the former French president and war leader Charles de Gaulle, who was asked back in the, who was known actually as a man who had simultaneously the uh, longest nose and the shortest temper in world politics at that time. And he was asked when he was president of France back, I think, in the 1960s, what do you think about China, Mr. President? To which he said, looking down that very long, very distinguished nose and said, China is a very large country inhabited by many Chinese people. <laughs> now, I could leave it there because, you know, after that, what is there to say? But I think I can probably go a little further than the late President de Gaulle, great statesman though he was, and of course a man who re-established full diplomatic relations between France and the People's Republic of, uh, uh, of China, and speak at a bit more length about what it is that makes up what is perhaps one of the most fascinating, not perhaps, I think it is one of the most fascinating, but, but perhaps the single most important country in terms of rapid political, economic and social change on the globe today. Before I make any sweeping statements or any further sweeping statements, I should just find out how much I'm likely to be rumbled today. Have we got anyone from China in the audience? Yes, a couple of people. Okay, good to hear. Okay, today's lecture is going to be in Chinese, so if you have any secrets, I will tell you. But you don't tell them. Good morning. I've just uh, told them that if anyone tries to leave this talk early, then they'll hold the door and make sure you stay for the entire length, <laughs> or something like that. I want to talk about modern China, not just in terms of the contemporary China that we see when we get on plane, go to Beijing or Shanghai, where I'm sure Google has all sorts of interesting interests these days, or Google, as of course it's known in, uh, in, in China. We will talk about that side of China, the China that's emerging and where it's going. But I also want to use the word modern to try and get over an idea of what kind of society China is, what it has been, and what it's trying to become and get to the idea of what many of the Chinese themselves, not all of, the, of them, of course, not universally amongst 1.2 billion people, but broadly speaking, what the Chinese themselves think of when they use the term modern to describe their own country and their own polity. And I want to start with something which is a bit of a paradox and have that paradox running through what I say today. And then I hope perhaps fuel a bit of discussion about China after I've finished, um, finished speaking. And that paradox is the following. China is a country which, in a sense, is running a sort of social and political experiment that in terms of its premises, in terms of its basic framework, combines two things that the modern world, use that term again, the modern world in the last hundred years or so, has not tended to see. And that is a society that is simultaneously very open in all sorts of ways. And that sometimes surprises people who like to think of China as a closed society. I don't think it is at all. But also a society that is not liberal in its assumptions. So it is an open but non-liberal, if you like, illiberal society. And this contrasts with 
the experience that many people had during, say, the Cold War, a period, I think, for Googlers of purely historical interest, since I know that you're all geniuses who came here at the age of about 12, but a few of you may have vestigial historical memories of the Cold War period, when the world divided itself to some extent into the idea of societies in the so-called free world that were liberal, democratic in their assumptions, and open in terms of transport, trade, um, and interaction, and then a world, the communist world in particular, that was literally behind a wall, Alice in Berlin, or at least very heavily restricted in terms of its contact with the outside world. Now, that latter form of restricted society doesn't remotely describe China today. China is all around the world in all of our lives, regardless of where we live or what we do. It's there in the goods that we buy, having become the world's most important exporting country. Uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, in our daily lives in terms of the uh, tens of thousands of Chinese students who start degrees every year in this country, the United Kingdom, or indeed in the US or Australia. It's in the business investors who have meant that China for the last few years has had more of its capital flow out of the country to invest overseas than it has attracted capital to actually come into China. And of course it's there in the numerous Chinese business people, students, software workers, um, artists, filmmakers and others who are very much part of that international traffic that goes between North America, Europe, Asia, Africa and the rest of the world. So definitely not a closed society, but at home, as anyone will also know, a country that takes a very different attitude towards the nature of state and society. It is a society that still has official censorship for books that are published in China in a way that wouldn't happen in a liberal society. It's a country whose media is also restricted in various significant ways, and it's a country where rights to do with law are exercised in the context of a ruling Chinese Communist Party. So you may think that's a good thing, you may think it's a bad thing, but one thing it's not is a liberal thing. And therefore, that paradox of being open but not liberal runs through the contradictions and I would say often the difficulties, but also the challenges that come from trying to make China into a country that sits at the forefront of modernity in the present day world. So to explain how we got there and why it matters, let me take you through a short historical journey before we get, oh, not that short, uh, before we get to the uh, present day. And we start with this gentleman here. Possibly, possibly one of only two Chinese who have world brand name status, if that's the right way to put it. One of those people, we'll see a little later, Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, the communist leader of China for more than a quarter of a century between the late 1940s and the mid 1970s. He's certainly a name who's still known around the world. But this figure, perhaps even more so, the great Chinese thinker Confucius, Kung Fu Tzu, the master Kung, uh, the inventor of a set of philosophical and ethical ideas way back in the 6th century BC, um, about the same time, broadly speaking, that some of the great Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato and so forth, were uh, beginning to develop their systems of thought on the, uh, the southern, uh, southern side of Europe. At the same time, some of China's greatest philosophers were also beginning to think about ideas of society and ethics. And as it happened, this particular thinker, Confucius, still known today often as China's number one teacher, began to put forward a system of ethical and social understanding of how the world fitted together that in many ways um, still has a great deal of valency, significance and power in the world of um, today, uh, the China of today. So to understand briefly what this system of thought was, how it differs from the way in which certain Western or uh, North American or indeed um, other Asian societies, Indian societies, for instance, have operated, it's worth thinking briefly what some of the ideas that someone like Confucius put forward were, because they were not just relevant to the world of the 6th century BC, but still continue to have a great deal of valency today. They're the ideas that, first of all, that correct and benevolent behavior towards one another is what makes a person virtuous or moral. The ultimate aim in the Confucian system of thought was to become 
a uh, Junza, a gentleman, a person of integrity, or even a Sheng, a sage, someone who really had the level of wisdom. There's a famous saying from Confucius, not one of the ones that you get from fortune cookies, but an actual saying from Confucius, that says that it's not until about the age of 40 that you can really have mature thoughts. And for many people at 60, you first begin really to understand what the world is about. So there's another clue. Unlike our own society in the West, which perhaps a little bit too much sometimes tends to have a sort of cult of youthfulness, Confucian values do value the old, the elderly, people with age and wisdom. At the same time, something else, which again is not very compatible with the modern world, is the idea that hierarchy, relationships and hierarchical relationships, are not just necessary, but actually positively important in the Confucian world. So that could be the relationship between the ruler and the ruled, or, I have to say, between the husband and the wife, bearing in mind this was uh, a, long, uh, a long time ago, uh, or between the teacher and the student. Again, that education, that bit of learning, very central to the Confucian worldview. In a sense, the only one of the five great relationships, as they are called in the Confucian world, that's purely equal, non-hierarchical, is the relationship between a friend and another friend. And in his day, I fear that meant male friend and male friend, although obviously that would have uh, uh, changed uh, uh, during the time when women's status rose in Chinese society, as it did in many other societies around the world. So bearing in mind that the Confucian system of thought, for good or ill, changing in various ways, had the same sort of cultural influence that Christianity or Greco-classical, Greco-Roman classical norms did on large parts of the Western and Mediterranean world, over the course of some two and a half thousand years, from the very, very earliest years of Chinese history, all the way through the many great dynasties I'm sure you've heard the names of, uh, the Tang, the Song, the Ming, uh, and finally the, the Qing, until the early 20th century. But then, things changed. And this is one of the places where they changed. By the early 20th century, China was not in good shape. For several decades, in the mid to late 19th century, China found itself for the first time up against an enemy that it could not absorb or conquer. And that was the enemy of Western imperial power. The British primarily at first, but then the French, also the Americans, and eventually the Japanese. These were people coming from the powerful industrial empires, mainly but not all from the Western uh, part of Europe, that brought with them gunships, uh, they brought with them uh, weapons, which they could use to open up and either colonize or at least dominate the uh, Asian and African countries, which didn't have that sort of firepower. They brought with them also two or three items, which in a sense were almost more dangerous in terms of the way they affected society than the guns themselves. In China, one of those was opium. Uh, tragically, but I think in historically um, entirely provably, one of the first major British encounters with China was the, force, uh, the, the forcing open of markets to sell opium into China, which became a huge scourge that affected large parts of society for many decades after that. The so-called Opium Wars, a term you may well have, uh, have heard, which still live in Chinese historical memory in the present day. But also, the third and perhaps most long-reaching um, import into China at that time to make a difference. If number one is guns, number two is opium, you might say. Number three was political thought. In other words, a whole variety of ideas, constitutionalism, new types of independent th thinking on law, um, ideas to do with um, uh, political change that came from parliaments, also from the relationship between the military and uh, the government, coming from places such as the newly emergent uh, Bismarck's Germany, uh, the British constitutional tradition, the French tradition of law, and American constitutionalism as well. All of these came into a China which was already battered by invasion, forcing lots of young people in particular to think that if they could not beat the West by using traditional Chinese thinking and methods, then they might have to adapt the Western system, at least for a while, to try and fight back. The country that actually did this most successfully was Japan, which in the Meiji reforms of the late 19th century changed Japan very rapidly from a traditional feudal samurai society where the most powerful weapon was the sword to one within a few decades that turned Japan into the fastest industrializing country in the world, 
with uh, warships, uh, its own parliament, uh, conscript army, and eventually colonies of its own. And China found itself on the wrong side of those arguments. There were many attempts at reform, but many of those came to nothing because the difficulty of getting the Chinese imperial court, the Qing dynasty of the time, uh, leading up to the last emperor of China who ruled all the way up to 1912, simply weren't able to adapt fast enough. And this led to a very significant set of political changes. In 1912, a revolution broke out over China that led to the abdication of the last emperor. Again, about 25 years ago, 30 years ago, Bertolucci made a great movie, the, the Last Emperor, which you might have seen or choose to see, which tells his story in some detail. It was very tragic. He was only five years old when he actually um, had to, uh, to leave the, uh, the, the throne. But even the establishment of a Chinese republic in 1912 did not stop the political and social rot. China was still being invaded from outside. People were still selling opium. It was still very, very vulnerable in terms of global trade and politics. It was a country that was being pushed around. And the, the kind of pivotal moment came on a date, which if you speak to any educated Chinese today, someone who's been through high school, someone who's been, you know, it doesn't even have to be university, and just say one date, Wu Si, May 4th, May 4th, 1919. This is a date which has a whole panoply of changes and ideas behind it. It's a bit like saying to people of, say, you know, your parents' generation, the 60s, which doesn't literally mean in the West 1960 to 1969. It means a moment of kind of political change, thought, liberation in America, in Paris, in London, all of these sorts of things. So in, an, a, in a way, the May 4th movement, the May 4th moment in 1919, symbolized a whole set of political changes. So just two seconds, what was what happened on May 4th, 1919? Well, this happened. This is sort of a, a, a similar picture. I think there wasn't actually a picture on the day itself, but it gives you an idea. This building, part of the Forbidden City in the center of Beijing, then as today, right at the heart of the Chinese capital, and in front of it, a demonstration. In this case, a demonstration of young people. 4th of May, 1919, you have 3,000 young people from China's Beijing's top universities, Peking University, Tsinghua University, gathering in front of the Forbidden City in Beijing. Why? Because just a few days earlier, they had heard a terrible piece of news from Europe. On the 30th of April, the Treaty of Versailles, the end of World War I, was signed. Now, many people in the West don't know that China was also a participant in World War I. They actually fought on the Allied side. If you've ever read the stories of the trenches, people, uh, young men uh, being killed in Flanders Field, all of that, the great story of World War I in, in Europe, people often don't, uh, don't often ask, where did the trenches come from? Who made them? And the answer in many cases was Chinese workers, 96,000 of them brought from China to these unfamiliar cold uh, fields in France and Belgium to do lots of things, work behind the scenes, but certainly digging the trenches. 3,000 of them died in the, the conditions of cold northern France and Belgium. Their graves are still there today. So having made this contribution, the Chinese thought that some of the imperial possessions which had been seized by the Germans in the late 19th century would be given back to China after uh, the peace treaty was signed. And they weren't. They were instead in a piece of skullduggery handed over to the Japanese. And this made China's young patriotic students in Beijing, when they heard the news, very, very angry indeed. 3,000 of them gathering outside the symbolic center of the heart of Beijing, saying it was time for China to take on two ideas, two ideas which to this day remain very important in thinking about what a modern China is. And one was called, in their terms, Mr. Science, and the other one was Mr. Democracy. In other words, the idea of technological modernity and the idea of political change more popular participation and democratic change. And demonstrating for these things, uh, um, not in the crowd that day, but certainly nearby and, and taking part in the wider political atmosphere, was a young man called Mao Zedong, who became one of the founder members of the Chinese Communist Party. So in 1921, just two years after this demonstration, the small group of the first group of communists in China would start the journey that would eventually lead them towards the conquest of the whole of China, and indeed to become the ruling party of China that they remain 
to this very day. So May 4th demonstration, very important turning point in terms of young patriotic Chinese thinking about why their country was doing so badly and determined that they would act to make sure that China was not put in that position in future. They were drinking in, of course, a whole atmosphere around the world. This was a time in the interwar period when political culture and artistic culture was changing rapidly. Figures like Marinetti, the great Italian futurist who put forward ideas of speed and modernity in art. There we have one of the iconic uh, artworks that actually, amongst other things, underpinned the eventual fascist movement that took over Italy. So not all of this modernity was necessarily very progressive. We also have the flowering of different non-Western, non-European people talking to each other rather than simply learning from the West. So I told you in the late 19th century, much of the constitutionalism and legal change came from examples in Western Europe as well as Japan. But the interwar period saw a great deal more conversation between India, China, Japan, about what they could learn from each other. And here actually we have an example of Jamini Roy, one of the great uh, Indian modernist painters, drawing on Indian folk art and um, uh, uh, becoming a great influence on many um, thinkers. Uh, in the non-Western world. This was also the era of Rabindranath Tagore, perhaps in some senses the most famous artistic figure in the world in the interwar period, a Bengali, first non-Western winner of the Nobel Prize, and a figure who was fated in Japan and certainly treated with great seriousness in China when he visited there. Um, an example here also of the kind of poetry that young modern Chinese wrote to try and express their excitement at the possibilities of democratic change and technological change that could help modernize China. And this poem here by the, uh, the poem uh, Tian Gou, uh, Heavenly Dog, by um, Guo Moro, who uh, became one of the most important poets of communist China, sums up this sort of uh, thought with these lines, I am the light of the moon, I am the light of the sun, I am the light of all the planets, I am the light of X-ray, I am the total energy, of the entire universe. And in the original, as you see, the italics there show that the original Chinese actually has those words in English put into in Western letters in the middle of the Chinese text to give it that sheen of modernity. Those of you who know a bit about poetry will perhaps recognize at least two influences here, one of which is the great American poet Walt Whitman of the late 19th century, who very much followed that kind of idea of the personal and the individual expressing something about the wider universe, but also Tagore, Gitanjali, um, one of the most influential non-Western poems of the time, very influential on uh, uh, the, uh, the, the European modernists, but also catching the eye of Guo Moro over in China, leading to a sort of Indian-Chinese influence there. So very much a cosmopolitan time, a time when people were thinking of all sorts of different ways of being modern and changing. But the politics of China also took a very dark turn during this period, because by the 1930s, the simmering tensions between the two greatest nations, or at least two biggest nations of uh, East Asia, China and Japan, came to a head. During the early 20th century, you could say that in East Asia, two rival political forces came into conflict with each other. On the one hand, on the mainland of Asia, Chinese nationalism, which I've mentioned, that May 4th movement, uh, turning into a wider sense that China needed to get back its own strength, its power, its sovereignty, uh, in terms of everything from politics to art to economics. And Japan, yes, becoming the most modernized nation of East Asia, as I've mentioned before, but also becoming its most powerful imperial power. And in the context of that, slowly but surely occupying more and more of Asia's territory. Taiwan in 1895, Manchuria in 1905, uh, Korea 1910, and 1931, and even more comprehensive takeover of the northeast of China, Manchuria. By 1937, China and Japan were essentially poised on the brink of war and finally clashed, came to arms, leading to an eight-year struggle for survival by China against the Japanese invasion. Eventually, we would come to know this war as World War II, since, of course, the European war would start two years later in 1939, and then with Pearl Harbor in 1941, the United States would come in, and the whole war would become global. But those eight years saw 
up to about 14 million Chinese deaths, 80 to 100 million Chinese becoming refugees in their own country, and the holding down of more than half a million Japanese troops on the Allied side. Once again, China playing an important but underreported role in terms of its contribution to the Second World War. And by the end of that time, by the end of that devastating eight-year war between China and Japan, um, the then nationalist government of China essentially collapsed under the weight of its own contradictions, as Marxists might say, leaving the way for that young, eager student who I mentioned briefly in 1919, having an interesting time thinking about politics in Beijing in 1919. Well, he had come a very long way in the 25 to 30 years after that. He had become part of the rising power of the Chinese Communist Party. And by 1949, that man, Mao Zedong, had become the ruler of all China. So in doing that, he had taken up one idea and taken it with him, which would be very, very important in terms of rethinking the way that China thought about being modern. Because when those May 4th demonstrators, those young patriotic men and women, demonstrated in front of the Forbidden City and started thinking about Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy, the one figure the one figure who many of them turned against violently was Confucius. They saw Confucius, the traditional sage who for two and a half thousand years in one way or another had underpinned Chinese thinking as not the solution, but the problem. The person whose ideas of hierarchy, of benevolence, of trying to keep a sort of ordered society had held China back. And they said, well, if Confucian thought gets us invaded by the West and, has, uh, uh, and leads China into disaster, then we need a very different way of thinking. And Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong's thinking, and the thinking of the Chinese Communist Party, was perhaps the most radical break with Confucius that existed in China's history. They argued that Confucius was a purveyor of feudal thinking, old-fashioned thinking that held China back. They argued that some of his ideas, such as benevolence, led simply to a society that could never move forward, and that sometimes terror and the use of violent tactics were necessary and even praiseworthy in terms of creating a new type of Chinese society. And that tendency found its ultimate um, expression in this um, uh, event that you can see just behind Mao's uh, head here, which is the Chinese Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s. This was the culmination of the period when Chairman Mao sought to consolidate his own rule. He had come to power in 1949, and there had been various ups and downs in China in the years after that, including the attempt at the Great Leap Forward, a massive program of economic modernization that went horribly wrong and led to the starving to death of tens of millions of people. So having seen this go wrong, Mao doubled down, in effect, by the 1960s, argued that what China needed was to overthrow every single part of its former system of government and society, and instead launch what he called a great proletarian cultural revolution, something which would smash beyond repair much of China's old culture and old customs to uh, basically set it on a path of a new, renewed modernity. And those who know even a little bit about the cultural revolution will know that it was a tremendously violent, tremendously we know that it was a tremendously violent, tremendously disruptive period in Chinese life when many great artworks and statues and museums were smashed up beyond repair because they were part of the old culture, where people who had education or knew uh, uh, about the pre-revolutionary uh, pre society um, as scholars or as academics were paraded in public and forced to confess their crimes or their sins because they were not part of this bright new revolutionary culture. It was an overthrowing of everything that old China had been in a desperate attempt by Mao to try and cleanse any remnants of the old Chinese society. And it was inevitable in that atmosphere that one particular figure would indeed become a victim, and that was Confucius. So Confucius, having underpinned Chinese society in many ways for two and a half thousand years, then gets a severe 
kicking, uh, intellectually speaking, through much of the 20th century as the May 4th generation turn against him in favor of Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. And by the 1970s, in the middle of Mao's Cultural Revolution, Confucius is being condemned as a black hand, as they put it, a, f a really kind of appalling remnant of the old society that must be driven out to enable China to progress. And this is a um, cartoon book here uh, from 1974, which, uh, as the caption says, tells the story of working people's struggle against Confucius. There was even an official campaign against him, which was actually aimed against the then uh, just departed um, uh, recently uh, killed uh, defense minister Lin Biao, but it was called the campaign to criticize Lin Biao and criticize Confucius. So Confucius was being put in the same breath as Lin Biao, a man who happened to be at that point Mao's worst political enemy. So absolutely the lowest point, you might say, in the 20th century for Confucius and his thought. That was 1974. Two years later, Mao Zedong died after 27 years at the top of the world's largest and most populous communist state. And there was a scuffle for succession, but the man who eventually came to power was a man who would essentially dominate Chinese politics for the next 20 years, well into the 1990s. And his name was Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping has some claim to perhaps be the single most important reformer of the Chinese 20th century, maybe in some ways even more than Mao. Because the China we see today, the China that is the second biggest economy in the world, the China that has geopolitical influence, is Deng Xiaoping's China, not Mao Zedong's China, in many ways. And that stems from a variety of things, but let's pin it down to one particular decision, because I think that's the one we want to concentrate on. Deng Xiaoping took the fateful, not fatal, but fateful decision that China's communist economy could not sustain the kind of economic growth and prosperity which he wanted China to have. And so he gave permission, essentially, for China to liberate its own economy, to reintroduce markets, to begin to shut down the collective farms and the state-owned factories that were an absolute central part of the Chinese planned economy, and to begin the very long and very bumpy road, which China has by no means finished traveling on even now, that would make China an anomaly in that it would be the world's biggest country run by a communist party which was overseeing a system of almost unbridled capitalism. And that particular paradox is one that has shaped the China we see today. It's the China that has created what you see in this picture, which is, on the one hand, the world's fastest growing economy in historical terms. Between, let's say, about 1980, when China's economy was really, in global terms, very small, to 2010, when you have um, uh, China becoming uh, essentially the, the world's uh, third or second uh, biggest economy, you have, at various points, double-digit growth year after year after year, 11%, 10%, 12% growth even during those years. And it's off the back of people like this, young women, often, working in factories producing garments, plastic goods, toys, you name it, furniture that were sold all around the world. At a time when the credit um, uh, boom in the Western world suddenly meant there were lots of dollars and pounds uh, for people to be spending money on Chinese-made goods. So that led to this huge wave of prosperity on both sides in the 1990s and 2000s. Many prices were paid to uh, bring that situation about. China developed what it still has today, a population of 150 to 200 million people who have no official right to um, special benefits in the place where they work because they're migrants, internal migrants within China. They're not illegal, but by moving away from their place of birth, they don't have the right to health care, pensions, education, and some of the things that, they, that residents in particular cities would have. But the pay is good enough and important enough to them that they move anyway. Now, that population is obviously something like two to three times the size of the whole population of the UK. It would be a large country's population in many, uh, in many places, and yet it's only a small proportion of the total Chinese population. In addition, China over those years has become much more economically unequal than it was under Mao. In Mao's day, it was poor, but it was also um, relatively equal. Now China has one of the highest Gini coefficients, the measures of economic inequality of anywhere in the world.
Rural pressures also became greater. Uh, although China is urbanizing fast, a few years ago, about three or four years ago, for the first time in its history, more Chinese people lived in cities than in the countryside. But that's still the best part of 650 to 700 million people living out in the countryside with a need for all the things that people living in a modern society uh, desire and have a right to, healthcare, pensions, welfare. And providing rural uh, frameworks for these very expensive public goods has become a real problem in terms of the uh, Chinese Communist Party's current policies. Because in a society where governments have voted in or out, you obviously have the choice of kicking out the government if you don't like what they're providing. In China, much of the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party is based on its economic performance. As long as the growth rate continues to, uh, uh, to bubble along, as long as people's standards of living continue to improve, which broadly speaking they have done in the last quarter of a century or so, there is probably enough residual goodwill within the system for people not really to have that much concern about the direct mechanisms of political control. But if those economic benefits go down, then the future of the system is clearly much more fragile. At the same time, China has started to develop many of the accoutrements of modern societies elsewhere in the world, even though it maintains a very different sort of one-party authoritarian political system. So remember what I was saying before about it being open but not liberal? Well, one of the aspects of openness, just one, was a willingness to take on board the increasingly internationalised culture of pop talent shows. Uh, you may or may not have followed the um, classic example of this, the Supergirl Chao Nu competition, which made a big splash in the mid-2000s in China. It was won by a woman who's become actually a uh, quite a big Chinese pop star in her own right called Li Yuchun, who uh, sang a version of Zombie by the Cranberries, if you want the details of uh, what she won with. But this was a very interesting exercise, which wasn't repeated directly, because of course, what they asked people to do on this TV station with all these singers was for people to get on their mobile phones and text in which of the um, candidates for a Supergirl singer they preferred. Now, someone in the party may well have noticed that getting people from all around the country to vote for their preferred candidate might or might not be a brilliant idea to put in people's minds. So that particular system was not repeated in later, uh, later years. But the culture that you see here of young pop stars, uh, rock music, uh, very individualised style of clothing, uh, is, you know, as far from the old Confucian norms as you could possibly imagine. And certainly the individualistic style of international consumerism is very much part of Chinese modernity. We also, of course, and bearing in mind we're here at Google, um, should point out that China has a very loud, very lively internet culture. And anyone who says that, you know, political and other kinds of social discussion are repressed in China is certainly accurate. There is a much more restriction on what people say in China than uh, in, uh, in the UK. But it would be entirely wrong to think that this means that there is not a very lively discussion about politics and society in general still going on. And the place where it goes on most strongly is on the Chinese net. It goes on actually also through Weixin, um, WeChat, and it goes on through a whole variety of QQ and a whole variety of different um, social media formats. But basically, the wired population of China has not only increased hugely in size, more than the, uh, uh, the US population by, by miles, uh, you know, 500 million and, and counting probably, but has also created new forms of social engagement that involve a different sort of state society relationship going on. Just one example, it was slightly more of a, a thing a couple of years ago, but it's still very much there, which is something called Renroswa, uh, the human flesh search, which I hasten to add is not some kind of cannibal zombie holocaust um, uh, horror. It is in fact a form of social engagement through the internet in which people put up videos about injustices that have been created or committed by local officials and ask for people to basically you know, have these taken to court or for action to be taken against corrupt officials. And the central authorities have been actually quite lenient in many cases about allowing these complaints to go on uh, Yoghu or Tudo, or the equivalents of, um, uh, of, uh, 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 of YouTube on the, uh, on the Chinese net because they provide a sort of safety valve for people to actually talk about real issues, real problems in their, own, uh, in their own lives. And that's something that simply couldn't have happened in that way without the Chinese internet being uh, as strongly enabled as it is. And that goes alongside Alibaba, 
Alipay and the whole variety of very, very high-level internet-enabled finance and commerce that has become such a um, mainstay of China today. There are, of course, though, many downsides to the development of this kind of technological modernity. China's environment has now become acknowledged by the Chinese government itself as one of the most pressing problems in terms of China's modernizations. Yes, it's the second biggest economy in the world, but that produces with it a whole variety of problems when it comes to actually dealing with the aftermath of that technology. What I'll say at this point is that on the one hand, China is one of the world's great polluters. On the other hand, it also has put more R&D and investment into green energy technologies than possibly any other country on Earth. And with recent news that we've had that the Trump administration in the US is cutting its engagement with uh, green uh, uh, energy uh, issues. It may yet be that China actually ends up taking the lead globally on this question, particularly if there's any attempt by the US to go back on the protocols of the Paris uh, Climate Change uh, Accords. So China's moment on the environment, although there are too many scenes that look like that, um, may well be coming. In addition, we have a whole variety of political changes in language that reflect the contradictions that still sit very much within Chinese society. The idea that it wants to modernize, that it wants to be open, that it wants to have a technological basis, but also that the party wants control. The one-party state has no intention of creating a liberal multi-party democracy. The Chinese Communist Party rules, and according to the party, will continue to rule indefinitely. So that led under the previous president, you see a picture of him here, Mr. Hu Jintao, um, along with various young pioneers, to an interesting revival of language. And the language came very much from the stable of Confucius. After half a century or more of Confucius being downgraded or condemned by Mao as a feudal character, now we are back in a world where Confucian language, the language of harmony, of hierarchy, of solidity, of benevolence, is brought back by the Chinese Communist Party in a big way. So one favorite phrase of uh, Mr. Hu, uh, the harmonious society, a very Confucian sounding phrase, became a standard uh, part of the political rhetoric. A statue of Confucius, you see one here, they are now very, very widespread throughout China. And certainly if you go to Chufu, the um, birthplace of Confucius in Shandong province, you will see plenty of uh, memorabilia, uh, some of it uh, um, uh, uh, including things like bottles of Confucius liquor or Confucius chopsticks, but certainly the brand name value of Confucius has really bounced back in a big way, and this is a big shrine for those who wish to pay respect to him. All again very much endorsed by the state. Uh, we have there a picture of a ceremony, ceremony on television uh, commemorating or celebrating the birth of Confucius more than 2,000 years ago in a sort of TV extravaganza. And we have here a scene from a uh, blockbuster movie on the life of Confucius, um, which uh, starred uh, the Hong Kong um, uh, action star Chao Yun-Fat, who went uh, from one of his earlier films called Hard Boiled, instead to uh, this idea of perhaps soft power, with uh, Confucius being uh, at, the, at the center of it. So very much back in, in popular culture. But let me finish this thought and perhaps turn to a bit of discussion by using this sort of final example here of why the revival of Confucius both has lots of potential in it, but also causes difficulties. Because Confucius, I think, is being put forward by the Chinese state, both domestically and internationally, because he's such a useful symbol. He symbolizes many things that are both attractive, but also useful to the party. Um, you know, nobody could be against the idea of benevolence, of good behavior to one another, uh, of um, a kind of uh, sense that an ordered society is better than a chaotic society. On the other hand, a thinker who puts forward the idea of hierarchy and knowing your place is obviously attracted to a party that still essentially rules through an authoritarian, very bureaucratic and uh, hierarchical structure. And he also gets used in this case when China, as is frequently the case, becomes angry at being criticized by the outside world. An example of this came in 2010 when the Nobel Peace Prize was given to the Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo, 
uh, who's actually in jail in China, but was given the Nobel Peace Prize for his writings um, criticizing the Chinese government. And the Chinese authorities reacted very badly to uh, this award, which they saw as an insult to China. So they launched their own alternative to the Nobel Peace Prize, the Confucius Peace Prize, which I have to say in the few years since has not really taken off in quite the, uh, the way that they, uh, they expected. One of the um, people awarded the Confucius Peace Prize was that well-known peace lover Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. <laughs> so I have to say the interpretation is certainly a bit wide in that sense. But the symbolism is, I think, important. Because on the one hand, launching an international peace prize is, I think, symbolic of China's increasing desire, and I think it's a sincere desire, to be a citizen in world order, to take part in that order of Nobel Prizes and international society in the United Nations that underpins wider society. At the same time, the desire not to be told what to do by the West in particular also figures into it, the idea that if the Nobel Prize goes to the wrong person, then you launch the Confucius Peace Prize, which puts forward an alternative view of the universe. And that, I think, speaks to where I started up, the idea that China is an open society and is engaging with the world in a way that is serious and sincere. But it's also not a liberal society. It's probably the society in the world today that most strongly puts forward sets of values that are antithetical and in opposition to many of the assumptions of liberal societies around the world. And I say the world, not the West, because they're also antithetical to the systems in Brazil in India, in South Africa, in Ghana, in a whole variety of places that have embedded a more liberal, pluralist model of politics. By way of pointing that out, I'm not saying this is good, I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm pointing out that this is the reality of what I think modern China has become. And as we think of that journey all the way from the early 20th century, the demonstrators on May 4th, 1919, in front of the Forbidden City, and then think of their sort of successors who are the students, the diplomats, the business people who bring China to the world and who we see when we go to China. I think we need to understand that that journey about what will make China modern is still very much a journey in progress. And that all of us, I hope, here sitting today may well be part of it in one way or another. Thank you all very much.